Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, today we are talking about Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. So John Keats is one of the most uh, influential and important romantic poets. So he is uh, the most celebrated English poet uh, from the Romantic era. Uh, in this lecture we will be talking about uh, Ode to a Nightingale, its background, the critical analysis on the poem and uh, then uh, the literary and poetic devices that John Keats has used in Ode to a Nightingale. Ode to a Nightingale is uh, written by John Keats and it was written in May 1819. It was written either in a garden, according to Keats' friend, under a plum tree or uh, in a room where Keats was sitting or, and listening to the sound of Nightingale from the window. And it was spring of 1819. So the tone of the poem rejects the optimistic uh, pursuit of player found within Keats' earlier poems and it explores the themes of nature, transience and mortality. The latter being particularly personal to John Keats, uh, that, uh, I mean mortality, uh, the Nightingale describes, uh, des uh, described in the poem experiences a type of death, but it does not actually die. Instead, the bird is capable of living through its song, which is a fate that humans cannot expect. The poem ends with an acceptance that player cannot last and that death is an unavoidable part of life. So in this poem, he imagines the loss of the physical or the real world and sees himself dead as a sort over uh, which the nightingale, uh, uh, nightingale, the contrast between the immortal nightingale bird and the mortal man is there. So he talks about uh, his own Im uh, mortality and the bird's immortality. Now sitting in his garden, his imagination becomes more present and uh, the presence of weather is uh, definitely noticeable in the poem as spring came early in 1819 which brought nightingales all over the heath or the land. So Ode to Nightingale uh, uses a lot of figurative language and words uh, which make us think that this is hallmark of, uh, of the poetic genius of John Keats. Ode to a Nightingale is a Horatian note, uh, written primarily in iambic pentameter. Uh, the Horatian note is simply a stanzaic form in which all stanzas are structured in the same pattern at the description of the poet, uh, I mean a rhyme meter number of the lines. More technically it is non-stanzaic or homostrophic ode, uh, like uh, stanzas are created uh, the way the poet wants to create. So this is in pentameter, there are five meters uh, that, are, that are used uh, in each line. And then, uh, uh, poem in this uh, poem, like uh, John Keats heard a nightingale, and, uh, and in, uh, he was then in a consideration of depth, the apprehension of uh, material beauty and the fascination of the world of deterioration. Keats was greatly admired in the Romantic Poet Circle, and O to Nightingale stands as one of the most famous poems. Uh, perhaps this is in the part because uh, poem's central figure, the Nightingale, remains elusive and ambiguous. For instance, the line, All Lady with Thee, in the fourth stanza, signals to many critics that the poet has entered a trance. Now this is particularly interesting because Keats was not known to take mind-alerting drugs for instance, opium, like the other romantic poets, such as his contemporary uh, Samuel Tyler, Tyler Coleridge, T. S. S. T. Coleridge, uh, ambiguous language such as uh, found in his line, contributes to the poem's universal appeal and allows modern reader to connect to the theme and motives of the work. It is also noteworthy to consider how an ode to a nightingale continues themes of subjectivity and self-consciousness that are found in his other works such as <coughs> Ode on a Gracian Urn or Ode to Autumn. In these poems specifically in Ode to a Nightingale, Keats elaborates uh, the power of imagination to escape ordinary and often painful reality. For instance, 
uh, he in his uh, sixth sentence of the poem says darkling i listen and for many a time i have been half in love with easeful death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into air my quiet breath so life is critical but song of nightingale is uh, not an ode to nightingale and its appreciation is always increasing it is also about hard life's experience of the poet that he expresses through this poem it is a journey from a real world to the world of imagination the poet escape, escapes to the world of nightingale he finds imaginative world more peaceful and harmonious than the real world however he is alone there too ultimately he returns with a lesson that escape is possible only with death so the way he wants to get escape first through the drugs then he discards the idea to going to night to go to nightingale using the drugs then he goes through poetry but his dull brain retards and perplexes him and he comes back ultimately so john keats in out to a nightingale makes a comparison between several things so that is a very good comparison that is making in this poem so some of them are like uh, art and life so he is making a comparison between art and life that the word of art is permanent and the life of human is not permanent that is transient in nature then mortality and immortality so uh, the life of bird is uh, mortal in a way that the essence of nightingale cannot die nightingale has been living for ages and will keep on living for a very long time till the eternity man dies so man cannot compete with the nature so the, the natural world is immortal and the human world is mortal and then there is comparison between the world of mankind and the world of nightingale so keats tells in this poem that the world of nightingale is away from sorrows miseries pains tensions tortures fever fat so all these things are found in the in the lives in the world of mankind natural beauty and artificiality so uh, there is also comparison between these two that the life of man is artificial but the life of nightingale and the natural world is full of natural beauty and this uh, comparison between pleasure and pain so he says that uh, uh, the world of nightingale is full of pleasure and the world of man is full of pain and then life uh, life and death that we uh, he tells like in old days emperors listen to the song of nightingale in a castle a princess listen to the song of nightingale ruth the biblical character listen to the so sound of nightingale and now kids is listening to that song so the very song will uh, remain alive for long but the man like kids the man like the king uh, women like the princess and the women like ruth they will die eventually but these things the essence of nightingale these things are never to come to an end so here we are talking about uh, the critical analysis of the poem so stanza one uh, of uh, the poem the poem starts with the sense of dullness mood of the poet is gloomy he sleeps while hearing the song of nightingale sleep overpowers him and he starts his journey to the world of nightingale it is one of the most important ingredients of the romantic poetry that it promotes escapism so like uh, every poet uh, every other romantic poet john keats is also an escapist in fact is the most escapist poet among them uh, romantic poetry is poetry of dreams and imaginations and ode to nightingale is also a dream because in the end uh, uh, no the critics uh, agree or disagree on this thing like uh, some of them say that it was a dream some of them say that he was at the height of his imagination and some of them say that it was a trance in between these two uh, feelings that uh, he was uh, half sleep and half uh, awake so uh, that depends entirely upon the reader how does he perceive the thing uh, we find the poet in the world of nightingale he hears its sweet song and enjoys it he is in a dim forest when nightingale is singing song he hears it without interruption poet uses a lot of images in the starting line of the poem for for example uh, trees shadows sun so uh, from these images he is 
uh, trying to t uh, believe in this thing that uh, the, the word of Nightingale is giving utmost player which he wants to catch in his heart and he's, uh, he's giving two contrary expressions in the very uh, beginning that he says my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pain so there is uh, drowsiness and there is numbness and now there is pain and there is numbness so when there is numbness there is no pain so pain is essentially a contrary uh, thing to numbness so we'll be discussing uh, all these facts later on in the stanza explanation and uh, the translation and explanation of the poem so uh, in this uh, way uh, there is a uh, uh, the poet has used Greek mythology. He's used is uh, using Hellenism in it, since he was uh, uh, like uh, greatly admi a, a admirer of Greek mythologies, Greek literature, Greek culture. So he's using such words which are part of Greek myths. So uh, dryad uh, is uh, like uh, the wooden nymph. Lethevord is a river in Greek mythology. So uh, he uses them. Then he also mentions that he is trying or he is willing to get escape and he is also ex uh, accepting the fact that uh, uh, the life of nightingale is full of player and the life of man is uh, full of uh, sorrows and uh, tensions so in stanza 2 uh, the poet is in fancy word he expresses his different desires firstly he wants high quality red wine he remembers difficulties of life and wants to forget them, but his sensitiveness does not allow him. Hence, he wants red wine. It would help him, like the uh, the grape wine. It would help him in his uh, in this regard. He wants wine from province. It is a region in southern France and famous from land for its landscapes, fun, jollity wine. So, he is mentioning the ways which could help him in. Uh, getting escape from the realities of life he talks about hippocrine so hippocrine is again uh, uh, again uh, like uh, it is a fountain near Mount Helicon in Greece so uh, the Greek references are here and then he's using alliteration uh, the beaded bubbles winking at the brim we'll be discussing poetic devices and literary devices at the end of uh, this lecture so uh, in stanza number three uh, he is of the view that life is tough and painful. It is much difficult to face harsh realities of life. No one can know these facts better than John Keats. Misfortunes of life disturb him. He wants to fade far away and quite forget the weariness, the fever and the fact. In this stanza, the poet sketches the word of reality. In real world, men sit and hear each other groan. It is full of sadness. People born, spend a sad life, palsy, paralysis, uh, some of them uh, were uh, remaining grow old and ultimately die. So some of them die uh, are, or uh, they are weak because of paralysis and some of them die due to old age. So the life is full of sorrow that he has shown here. Kids does not talk about uh, his own anxieties only. He is talking about all the human beings. He also talks about the people, uh, the worries, the fever, the fret. It gives uh, this poem a universal appeal that is not being subjective. Nevertheless, objectivity is still therein. Uh, we can't deny that men in this world uh, grow pale and finally die. Like This is not the case with all the men, but uh, he, when he talks about his place, yes, uh, most of the people did. Death is certain for everyone. It is bitter truth. Even lovers, passions of love cannot save a person from death. Uh, uh, death makes the poet sad. So he is afraid of death here. He is afraid of fever. He is afraid of fright. So he is expressing his own anxieties. And uh, this, uh, this is not only his own anxiety. This is the anxiety uh, of every human being there. And stanza 4. He starts with escapism. Away, away, for I will fly to thee. In the start of the poem, the poet asks for the distracted mind, but uh, in this in this stanza, he gives up this idea. He needs no uh, uh, chariots of Bacchus and his parts. Bacchus is the god of wine, of course, uh, from Greek myth. 
so he uh, splendidly uh, the back is spl uh, splendidly rises uh, rides on his uh, mount but keats is rejecting this idea the poet does not want it either however he wants to escape from this world for this purpose he chooses viewless wings of poetry his poetic imagination can help him to start his journey to a new world where he sees a shining moon regardless of the darkness so this is his sensuousness his sense of sight that is using so the poem also includes his sensuousness apart from escapism that using his imagination he is explaining to us his sense of smile a uh, sense of smell sense of touch sense of taste sense of uh, sight and sense of listening so he is telling everything using his sensuousness john keats has created <coughs> many wonderful images in this stanza he also refers to the god of wine we can witness the strong imagination of the poet here he is confident that neither wine nor the chariot of bacchus but his own imagination can take him to the fancy world the world of nightingale he rejects the idea of wine here hence it is no more required perhaps he has realized that wine is a temporary solution all the imagination is also not an everlasting solution yet it is better than the wine moreover it is beautiful sentiment so he is preferring the positive escapism uh, or positive ways of escapism on the negative ways of escapism uh, in in stanza 5 keats uh, Poetry here is appealing to the senses. Out of five human senses, three can be witnessed in this sense, which are sight, smell, and uh, touch. So, uh, Keats, despite uh, being wherever he was sitting, you, uh, he is with Nightingale, under the Nightingale in the forest, where he is listening to the Nightingale, and he is feeling the presence of so many objects around him. He is looking at them, he is smelling them, he is touching them, so in the world of imagination he has seen the shining moon this darkness everywhere therefore he cannot see anything nonetheless he can feel and smell flowers when his feet touch them he starts his stanza with the following line i cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet so he's telling that he can see them he can smell them he can uh, feel those things around him he guesses from the smell of flowers that they are white hearthstone and eglantine and then he talks about mid May's eldest child called musk rose it is the first flower that grows in the middle of May there is also another image in this stanza which is of murmuring flies so from the above lines uh, uh, in this stanza whatever uh, and uh, like almost all the lines uh, we can draw the conclusion that poet is in deepest oblivion. Description of the natural image is evident that John Keats is a true romantic poet. Flowers, bushes, moon, rays, flies and the trees pr uh, prove that uh, poet has high imaginative powers. So in stanza 6, the poet is still in imaginary world with the nightingale it is much pleasant that and peaceful for him as peaceful as death he has no fear of death he sees death as a freedom easeful death is a kind of consolation for him death actually is a solution of Keats problems at this moment of life nothing can help him but death he wants peace he wants death at this moment of life, nothing else is required by him. He just wants uh, die. He wants to die in such a way that he's listening to the sound of nightingale, and his soul leaves his body. Although he finds uh, it in the world of imagination, yet it is, it is temporary. He can be with nightingale using his imagination, but that is not going to last for a long time. Death is a permanent solution. He wants a permanent solution, thus. He has found it. If death approaches him, it would bring him greater happiness. However, 
The only loss which he observes is that he would not be able to hear the eternal song of nightingale. So he says that the bird will mourn on his death but he would have become a sword. So he would be an inanimate object. He will, his sense of hearing will not work then. He could not be able to listen. He would not be able to listen to the sound of nightingale. But nightingale will keep singing. So it will keep singing forever. But Keats, since he's a human, as we have discussed before, so there's contrariness or there's a contrast between life of man and bird. So man will die, but that sound of bird, that is immortal. <clears throat> so in stanza 7, this stanza is the crux of the whole poem. Keats has already described the real world in the stanza 3 of the poem. This stanza is entirely opposite to the former one. He completely demonstrates the word of Nightingale. He puts two things in juxtaposition, life and everlasting song of Nightingale. Seventh stanza of the poem is also a comparison between mortality and immortality. Humans have limited time to live and that too is full of worries. On the other hand, the song of Nightingale is endless. He expresses his thought in the following lines. Uh, the beginning lines of the seventh stanza that was not born for death, a mortal bird. So the nightingale has been singing songs for many years. Many emperors and clowns have heard this song. It was being listed before Keats' birth and even after his death it would be listened by so many uh, listeners and uh, it would be listened by so many people when the Keats is dead. In this way, Song of Nightingale Gale is immortal. He refers Ruth from the Bible. She was a maiden. She was uh, captivated by a cruel king. Keats is of the view that she has also listened to the so uh, Song of Nightingale when she was in her distress. In short, it has been heard by kings, knights and warriors and maidens and uh, will be listened in future. Uh, the poet proves that Song of Nightingale is immortal whereas life on the other hand uh, uh, like he's giving a reference to human being that their life is mortal. So talking about Ruth here, so Ruth is sometimes uh, some critics say that uh, uh, like uh, some versions say that she was under the influence of a cruel king and some say that she was uh, married to a person who died and uh, her husband family shun, in our, shun, him, shun her out of her house. So she had nowhere to live. So she was all the time alone and uh, amid the alien corn she was listening to the sound of nightingale. So in stanza 8 with the word forlorn, the poet returns from imagination. His mood is sad. Songs, flowers, trees, moon, forest and roses they inspired him but he has he had to come back he had to come back to the real world so there is no other option for him he cannot stay there forever the poet knows that word of imagination though it gives player though though it gives peace yet it is a lie he calls it a deceiving elf at the end song of the nightingale is fled so that as imagination of the poet look both of them are gone like the song of nightingale is gone and the, uh, the the power of imagination that is gone his imagination breaks and uh, he ends the poem with a question he writes flood is that music do i wake or sleep so oh to a nightingale in a nutshell is the expression of his feelings it is highly impressive poem of John Keats. The poem is evident that he is true, romantic and a pure poet. It reveals his strong imagine, imaginative powers. He has successfully managed making comparisons and, comparisons and demonstrations uh, of nature and its objects. He has proved that uh, Song of Nightingale is immortal. It has also been proven that uh, uh, imagination is pleasurable and the life is painful. Sidney Colvin makes uh, a remark about this poem and he says 
Ode to a Nightingale is uh, uh, like among the varied glories of the English poetry. So he calls it one of the best poems ever. Well, in this slide, we are uh, discussing the literary devices uh, that are used in Ode to a Nightingale. Uh, literary devices are the tools used by writers and poets uh, to convey emotions, ideas, and beliefs. With the help of these devices, they make the text appealing to the reader. Keats has also used some literary devices in his poem to make it unique and appealing. Uh, the analysis of some of the literary devices is here in front of you. Uh, that is uh, that is used by John Keats in his uh, remarkable poem O to Nightingale. So, first device that he uses is alliteration. Alliteration is a repetition of consonant sound in the same line, such as the sound of the in that the light wing dryad of the trees. So, uh, the beginning two words that and thou are uh, from the same consonant sound, and they are creating alliteration in the sentence. Uh, moreover. Uh, in the second stanza of the same poem, he says that uh, beaded bubbles winking at the brim. So beaded bubbles and brim, they are creating alliteration with each other. So uh, the use of alliteration creates uh, a melody that uh, that gives a player to the ears and the eyes when we are reading them or listening to them. Uh, moreover, uh, alliteration is often used to uh, make a sentence worth it or uh, like w uh, it creates uh, a, a kind of uh, impulse in that like uh, uh, it makes a sentence uh, lively for example how high his honor holds his haughty head so all the words are alliterated they are uh, beginning with the same consonant sound uh, so uh, second we have simile, so simile is a figure of speech used to compare something with something else to make its meaning clear. So Keats has used uh, simile in the last stanza for long. The very word is like a bell. So uh, this is uh, an excellent line written by John Keats, for long the very word is like a bell to turn me back from thee to my soul self. So here the poet is comparing for long to a bell. So, uh, this is one of the in instances of the use of simile. He has used similes everywhere in the poem. Then he has used enjambment. Uh, enjambment refers to the continuation of a sentence without a pause after the end of a line in a couplet or a stanza. For example, my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the train. So, he's connecting my sense to the previous line. Keats has used imagery. The use of imagery makes the readers visualize the writer's feelings, emotions or ideas. Keats has used images to present a clear and vivid picture of his miserable plight such as Thou of hemlock I had drunk, passed near the meadows, fast fading violets covered up in the leaves. So these are the imageries that he is using. We tend to uh, feel that he is uh, showing us something. We go to those images, like the, his imagery makes his poetry so descriptive that we actually begin to feel, we actually begin to see, we ac actually begin to realize the condition of the things that he is discussing there. We tend to know his plight, we tend to know his feelings the way he is feeling there. Uh, we also tend, tend to see what he is trying to show us. So we uh, are very much uh, engrossed in all the images that he's giving us through his poetry. Then he uses assonance. So assonance is the repetition of the same vowel sound in the same line of the poetry such as the sound of O in some melodious plot. So uh, the vowel sounds, uh, E sound, the voice uh, I hear this passing night was heard. So assonance is there. There is repetition of vowel sounds uh, like uh, there was a repetition of consonant sound in alliteration, so in assonance we have repetition of the vowel sounds. And then we have metaphor. There are two metaphors used in the poem. The first one is used in the line, uh, 11th line, for a beaker full of warm south. 
So here he compares liquid with the southern uh, country weather. So uh, this is a metaphor. So the difference between metaphor and simile is very clear. That when uh, we are comparing the attributes of something with something, this is simile. Or when we are giving some attribute of one thing to another, this is uh, metaphor. Like if I say he is as brave as the lion, so this is simile. Or if I say he is the lion, so this is metaphor. Keats uses personifications to give human qualities to non-human things. Keats has used personification in 29th line where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes as if the beauty is human and cannot see. The second example is in 36th line the queen moon is on her throne. Like queen moon is uh, here he is referring to the a heavenly object moon itself and uh, he also says a starry face so he's comparing the star with the fairies that are moving or dancing around the queen moon so uh, that is also example of uh, personification so he's uh, using uh, personification uh, you know to a nightingale uh, so personification basically is when we are giving human qualities to non-human things if I say that uh, uh, the crops were dancing, the, uh, the flowers were dancing. So flowers cannot dance, they can move uh, when, the, uh, when the wind blows. Uh, human beings dance. So when, if I say the crops are dancing, it means that I am using personification. Anaphora uh, is another device that he has used. It refers to the repetition, initial words of the sentences in sequence or in the whole stanza of even the poem. Keats has repeated the word where in the following lines to emphasize the existence of his imaginative word for example where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leading eyed despairs where beauty cannot keep a lustrous eyes so anaphora in linguistics means referring back like something is mentioned and now you're referring back to that object so here too he is using anaphora in the same way that he has already mentioned a place so this where is now connected to the word of nightingale so where palsy shakes a few uh, and then he is making he is also making a comparison so can he, he is making uh, it connected with the word of nightingale in a way that there is a comparison. He is uh, making a comparison between the word of human beings and the word of the nightingale. So all, the, all these things that he is mentioning, they are not present in the word of nightingale, rather they are present in the word of human beings. So where palsy shakes of you, like in the word of human being, where youth grows pale, so that is very much with the mankind, where but you think is to be full of sorrow, he is talking about the materialistic word, the artificial word. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, Keats is very much talking about his own word. So, and again, Keats is making a comparison with uh, mentioning by mentioning these things. He means to say that these things are non-existent in the word of Nightingale. Then he is using apostrophe. So, an ap uh, apostrophe is a device used to call somebody from far. So, this is not this is unlike uh, the apostrophe we use in grammar. Uh, the poet has used this device in uh, 61th line. Thou was not born for death, immortal bird. So he is tending to call him and uh, he is using apostrophe here in that way. Then uh, there are poetic devices that Keats uses in Ode to a Nightingale. So those poetic devices uh, are, first of all, he has stanza. So, uh, stanza is a poetic form of some lines. So, there are eight stanzas in this poem with ten lines in each stanza. Rhyme scheme. The poet follows rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, E throughout the poem with the iambic pentameter. So, uh, but what does this mean? Uh, a, B, A, uh, th this shows that first line is uh, rhyming with this third line second line is rhyming with the fourth line fifth line and onward like C, where is C stands for the rhyming of one line to 
uh, the third last line though it is connected with that so in this way the rhyme scheme is there uh, uh, like first uh, first line will be ending with the same rhyming word as the third line is ending so end rhyme is uh, the second thing uh, third thing sorry end rhyme is used to make the stanza melodious such as in the first stanza rhyming words are pain drain drunk sunk so these are the end uh, rhyme words where he's making uh, a rhyming of them there is internal rhyme so internal rhyme is rhyme within a line such as in the line to tell me back from thee to my soul self two words are me and thee rhyme with each other to tell me back from thee me and thee are rhyming with each other so they are used as internal rhyme then is used iambic pentameter so it is type of meter consisting of five ams so the poem comprises iambic pentameter such as uh, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pain so the bold ones are the air uh, aims which he has used so there are five aims that is used in this so there are five meters basically that he is used is he has used in this his poem then there are themes so in o to nightingale there are certain themes and uh, uh, like uh, his poem is replete with these first of all the versions of reality so keats is showing us two versions of reality one version of reality is uh, where the keats is uh, him his own self is existing and one version of reality is where the nightingale is flying so nightingale is also existing in reality keats is also existing in reality but the the version of reality that john keats is going through is very much different from the version of reality that nightingale is going through so nightingale is very much closer to the concept of immortality and uh, john keats is uh, very much closer to the con concept of mortality the second theme is immortality that is prevailing all over uh, and uh, like uh, john keats is suffering from this uh, uh, tragedy in this poem that uh, his life is mortal one uh, one day he has to die though he wants to die soon because uh, to get permanent escapism from the mysteries of the world but yes he uh, is uh, feeling this way that uh, the nightingale is immortal and night nightingale has been there since ages uh, uh, for, for for ages till now so uh, he is trying to explain this fact that nightingale is uh, belonging to such a place the natural world which cannot come to an end though hungry generations treat the down he says that hungry generations of human beings have tried to kill nightingale and the natural world but the natural world has never ended so natural world is immortal the world of him human being the world of mankind is mortal then keats talks about beauty he talks about the internal beauty he talks about the permanent beauty and that permanent beauty is in the realm of nightingale that is in natural of uh, natural world that is not in human world so he has he has also said that where beauty cannot keep a lustrous eyes it means the beauty in the human world that is transient that is temporary the beauty with the natural world is permanent then he talks about the transient human world that human world is uh, not permanent everyone uh, grows up he is suffering from diseases he gets pale or he suffers from paralysis and he dies nightingale is all the time singing man is uh, suffering from his miseries but uh, nightingale is not suffering from any misery nightingale is living and enjoying its world or its life so man and the nature is another scene that man is in love of the nature so nature is something that is a balm that is a soothing thing that gives a charm to the people charm to the humanity uh, it gives solace it gives uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, like uh, it is something that is making your life uh, uh, out of pain it is giving you balm it is giving you pleasure it is giving you perfection it matures you it teaches you so wordsworth says that to him nature was like a mother to him nature was like a god so he uh, he had the view of pantheism that he found the depiction of god in nature so 
kids also is using the same concept here that nature is uh, sublime nature is superior and nature is permanent man is not then death is uh, important same in this that kids is using uh, uh, very good words for death as he himself says that I have used very I have called death with many soft names in my many poems uh, muse rhymes uh, basically so he says that I have called death with beautiful names I'm not afraid of death uh, people are afraid of death but I am not afraid of death I want death to come to me and take into air my quiet breath so that I may die and I'm listening to the sound of nightingale so this would be the best death ever so he wants to get rid of the world because of his miseries, because of his problems, tensions uh, and his, uh, all the tragedies that, that he has suffered in the world. Uh, apart from all these things, he wants really uh, to die in a way that uh, he has to become a part of Nightingale's world. So he doesn't want to die uh, and uh, like... Uh, bring an end to his life he wants to die and then be converted to the world of nightingale forever so he wants to become the part of natural world forever so to him death is no loss to him death is no misery and the miseries of humanity he has discussed that uh, the life of human beings is full of sorrows miseries problems tragedies tensions uh, the diseases and he's also making a comparison that nightingale is not suffering from these diseases. So these were the prevalent themes in Ode to a Nightingale. So uh, we can uh, have further analysis of the poem in when we are explaining the poem in the next uh, video. So this video is a continuation to that video where we have uh, uh, described uh, the text and the uh, explanation and critical comments. Thank you very much. That is from my side. Allah Hafiz. Stay tuned.